Okay, if you have a Bible today, um, I'd like to read from 2 Kings in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 1. And um, I'd like to suggest that, I know I've, I've said this before, you might have heard me say it, but I think it's important. Um, the, the most important thing about understanding the Bible, and I think that's what we, we, ought, we ought to want to understand, uh, what it is. I think that's important to understand it. Uh, it's, it I, I don't think it really does as much good if we don't understand it. And I think uh, dealing with it honestly and understanding it is very important. And I think the most important thing to understanding the Bible, the most important fundamental thing is when you pick up the Bible, the, the most obvious thing you ought to notice, first and foremost, is that it is divided. It's not one thing beginning and going straight through to the end. There is a big division. And the division is evident uh, in uh, the table of contents and uh, sometimes on the very cover. And just looking through it, you can see that it's divided into old and new. It's labeled that way, Old Testament and New Testament. Now, what most uh, what most Christians want to do uh, is, or it seems to me, uh, you know, dealing with people, uh, talking to people, but and in my past experience, it seems to me that most Christians want to smooth over the difference and imply that it's a, a unity. And there is a, a unifying, there is something that unifies it. But I don't think that it uh, can be so easily smoothed over. And if you, if you do, you, you run into some serious contradictions. And it's important, I think, to face the, the, the fact that it is divided and to recognize the fact that things are different in the old than they are in the new or else there wouldn't be any division. If there weren't any distinction or any difference, we wouldn't have old and new. And what makes the distinction between old and new is a person. Mm -hmm. And that person is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And he makes the difference. And that's why we call ourselves Christians, uh, referring to Christ. Now we think sometimes the Christian life is all about me and trying to straighten my life up and fix my life up and, you know, and kind of a self-help program, but it's not that. The Christian life is all about Christ and Christ changing our lives. You know, when he said to his disciples, when Jesus called his disciples, he didn't go and find a bunch of saints who had halos over their head. He found fishermen and tax collectors, just ordinary people going about their ordinary lives, and like Peter, James, and John, and Matthew, and these different disciples. Uh, those are the, the big names that we recognize. And he found these men, and you read about it in the Gospels, and he would come across these men that he chose and called for his disciples. And he would say to them, follow me, he said, follow me. Follow me, and I, he said, will make you fishers of men. Now, if you forget about the fishers of men part just for a second, think about what it is that he's saying. He says, you follow me, and I will make you. That's what he said those first disciples. Follow me and I will make you. And I think that principle is true still today. We All we do is we follow him and he makes us. It's his responsibility to make us. I find that when Paul wrote to the Philippians, I'm going to read you in 2 Kings just a minute. This is just, I'm just introducing. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, he wrote to them in the first chapter of his letter to the Philippians, he said, He that began a good work in you will bring to completion. I think it's important that he says it that way. He that began a good work now, I think what Christians often uh, instinctively think is, I began a work, and I better get busy and bring it to completion. Paul didn't say it that way. He said, He that began, and He is Jesus. He began a good work in you. You see, when we become Christians, when we... And, and by the way, what makes us Christians is just one thing. It, it's not a code of ethics. It's not a code of conduct. It's Jesus. It's that we accept and receive and embrace by faith this person, Jesus, who makes all the difference. Now, I started to say that uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament are different, and what makes the difference is Jesus. In the Old Testament, you have God on one hand and people on the other hand. And there's uh, a problem, because God is perfect, and He's perfectly righteous, and He's perfectly holy. And you have people, on the other hand, who no matter... Um, the relative difference between them, some may be better than others, none of them are as perfect and as holy and as righteous as God is. And so we have a little uh, disconnect. But you see, Jesus comes onto the scene, and he is a man, 
And he is also perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, and acceptable to God. Uh, his life is perfect and pleasing in the eyes of God. And so we become Christians not by trying to duplicate his performance, but by embracing him as our mediator between God and man. He's the mediator between God and man. And I wanted to start this morning by illustrating this and, uh, and, and showing you a very clear uh, instance of this difference. Now the reason I'm, I, th I think it's important, that, see a, a lot of the, our thinking gets confused sometimes because you know we sometimes we think a lot of things, we don't really examine what it is we think, and then we hear things, we hear other people say things. And I think, just me personally, I think the Christian world at large, there's a lot of confusion, almost kind of a schizophrenia, sort of. And, and the confusion comes between not clearly sorting out what's old and what's new. And I promise you that the relationship between God, well, see, some people will say, well, God didn't change. No, he didn't change, but the relationship between God and man, Jesus changed the relationship between God and man by coming into the world. And things you read about God and his dealings with man in the Old Testament are no longer true. But if you don't know that, you assume a lot of things that are not true and that are unhelpful, not just in the way we deal with other people, but in our own relationship with God. Because in our lives, we need God. We need his participation in our lives. We're not just here trying to make our way on our own. We need it, but there are things that are obstacles and they exist right up here. They're not on God's part. The obstacles are in our own misconceptions many times. I was thinking this morning about uh, this big hurricane that's coming up the East Coast. You've probably heard about this, you know. And it, it almost never fails whenever there's some natural disaster, or you remember the tsunami that came uh, several years ago and uh, killed a lot of people. I heard this then, and anytime there's any kind of calamity, some, for some reason, people look at these things and think they see the hand of God at work. Um, in well, This is God's judgment. Or I remember, uh, I haven't heard it so much this year, we've had a pretty dry year. This has been kind of a drought for us. I remember some years ago, uh, a similar condition, and talk, that, well, this is God's judgment, you see, we're withholding rain. I remember on 9-11, uh, you remember that, of course, everybody, it's kind of like... Uh, the Kennedy assassination. Everybody remembers where they were you know, on 9-11. I remember, too, what, what we were doing and where we were. But I remember, you know, it's like you couldn't get away from the TV. You just, you know, we just wanted to see what was going on with this. It was so shocking. And, and I remember, uh, this isn't now a story that I heard secondhand. I saw this myself on, in television coverage. I saw some uh, preachers on television discussing 9-11, the planes that crashed into the Twin Towers. And one of them said, this is God's judgment on America. Now, I, I want to tell you, and I want to suggest that 9-11 was not God's judgment on America, that he didn't have anything to do with it. Sure. And God, if he'd had his way, would have, stopped, would have prevented it. He, that wasn't his will. That was somebody else's will. Sure. You mean to say that other people can do something, something that's not God's will? Oh, yeah, you have too. <laughs> you have in your life done things that were not God's will. <laughs> I don't need to be more specific, do I? I'll, I have in my life. We have the capacity as human beings to exercise our free will. In the beginning, when God made man in his own image and in his own likeness, one of the characteristics, I believe, that makes man in the likeness of God is he can choose for himself. He can, he can choose. And Adam, you read about Adam, and again, he chose. God, God let them choose. Uh, we cho Hurricanes are not God throwing a storm around. Droughts are not God. You know, when when that, when I heard someone say, "Well, this is God's judgment," this, the drought. Or the, I thought my first thought was, "Well, what has He got against us here? Why pick on us?" I can think of some worse places, and He God's judgment more than North of us. We're not the worst place in the world, you know. Um, but here, let me just read you something. Let's let's read. Have you found Second Kings? I do all that introducting so you can have time to find Second Kings. <laughs> But if you haven't found it by now, just give up and uh, I'll put it on the screen. Now. now, it says, Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. I have to point out that where we are in the story is that uh, God unified the nation of Israel under King David. And then David's son Solomon was a great and a rich king, and he extracted taxation from the people. And after Solomon died, when Solomon's 